I really just don't even know where to begin with this one. This game was recommended to me in the comments of my Vice Age video by my friend Fatal Steven, and um, I just want to make sure we're clear on this for the future, for anyone providing suggestions. I'm looking for horror games to play and review, not comedy. I say this because, well, this game was just absolutely hilarious how bad it was. She could actually be a 300 pound dude who lives in his mama's basement in suburban Detroit. And her name is Chuck. I mean, seriously, I could turn this review into a roast session, but I'm going to do my best to be fair and give you both the good, the bad, and the ugly. Listen, you decrepit old bitch. Even though this is primarily going to be bad and ugly. But let's start with the first level in your new home. Long story short, you've just inherited a new home from a family member because you've turned 18 so you can legally reside in the home. You play as Daniel and you're almost immediately spooked by the ghost of the house. I say ghost loosely because, well, I mean, just, just look at her. Now, what is this intro even? Actually, you know what? Let's let's just not even talk about it. Things start off fairly simply, trying to build the story, and Daniel is just using a dating app on his computer. But the only person he connects with is his own sister. Yeah, I, I wish I was making that up, but uh, she conveniently lives across the street, and she tells him that she's his sister during the cutscene to the next chapter. Now, besides this freaky looking woman and a self cameo by the game itself, this starting chapter is extremely simple. Essentially, your tasks are to pick up your laundry off the floor, fix the broken grandfather clock, and talk to your own sister through the dating app. Not much room for error, but uh, this game finds a way to be problematic. Such as this note that when you inspect it, you're unable to exit the inspection and are forced to exit back to the main menu and ultimately have to restart from the last checkpoint. Another minor thing, but for whatever reason you're blocked off from using the stairs at some point. There's a few very minor nitpicks I could call out as well, but they're more the game dev in me and honestly none of you probably care about them, so I'll just move on to the next chapter. Between the first chapter and this next one, you're given a cutscene of Daniel and Martha in a car heading towards the next destination. You get this moment where a tree suddenly crashes down and blocks your path. And now you're in this forest area and have control of Daniel again. Oh, but before the cutscene ends, you are given a gun by Martha. So now you have this golden desert eagle with 12 rounds in a magazine. But honestly, don't even worry about the ammo. This game makes sure you're full of ammo at all times. Every 5 seconds you've got an ammo resupply, which gives you an additional 12 bullets. And you can hold a maximum of 36. So yeah, you're good on ammo. Especially when most of the enemies you encounter here aren't even required to be killed to progress. And no joke, since I had to restart this level at one point, I decided to just run through this first encounter here without even shooting any of the enemies. But at the end, I still heard the same dialogue from Martha about hearing gunshots. Really? Tell me where those gunshots are, Martha. Are those gunshots here with us right now? I guess they just didn't predict us to simply run through like that, huh? Now, since I speed ran the level, because to be honest, I wasn't very interested in it yet, I didn't get to find out how the gunplay felt until about five minutes later. On the path to get to this level's boss fight, you are presented with multiple forks in the road, which you have to choose to go either left and right. At this point, just choosing your path is the only puzzle, which isn't really a puzzle, it's just really a choice. And once you re uh, reach a specific pathing split, Martha calls you. 
What's odd about this is that while you're able to just walk around like you normally would while you're on a phone call, the second you hang up, you're forced to stop moving and wait for Daniel's animation of putting the phone away into his pocket in order to keep walking. Like, what? Why? You, you, Daniel just can't multitask? That's, that's pathetic, man. Come on. Beyond that, I mostly just walked through the path to try to get to my destination. There also isn't really anything to do besides walking and running through the level yet, and there weren't any puzzles to solve yet outside of the optional combat, which obviously isn't even a puzzle. It doesn't even feel like there's any gameplay to be had during most of this level. There are a few jump scares along the way, but I didn't jump at any of them. Instead, I ran full sprint at them just to see if I could interact with any of them. Spoiler, nope, couldn't do it. I kept going until I reached the boss fight. This is really the first time in this entire level where I was able to have some fun and enjoy the combat, which was unfortunately very short-lived. Also, the AI in this game are sometimes, uh, special? They often reminded me of this dude from Crank Yankers, except he'd probably be more of a challenge. That isn't even a joke either. With the amount of ammo that this game gives you and the ability to basically dodge the enemy, which, by the way, I didn't even think to use until the end of the game, but we'll get to that. The boss fights in this game are exceptionally easy. The cemetery, which I was hoping would be much better, ended up feeling the shortest. The cemetery itself is fairly small, and the layout is, simply put, not good. There are spots that should have been opened up more to allow for the loop so that the players can walk around the entire area and not get caught up at what seems like dead ends. Oh, and guess what's right alongside the cemetery? A children's playground! What an ideal location, huh? Now, this game really takes the you'll do what I want you to do when I want you to do it approach here, which to me ruins the greatness of player agency. When you take away the player's agency, you are basically just treating them like you are undeserving child and saying, you can't do this until you've done this chore. What I mean is, they have this obvious note, which you can read by angling the camera in just the right way, but you can't interact with it until you've done the steps before to trigger the ability to do it. Then, triggering it essentially causes this new grave to spawn in for you to interact with. Oh, and see these two police cars here? Yeah, when it's time, you have to interact with them. But the catch is, you have to do it in a specific order. Now, what gets me the most isn't the fact that all of these things have to be triggered in a specific order. Not the boss of this level, which is actually kind of cool, but again, too easy. And not the corny jump scare that you get once you get to that spot. But rather this fence right here. Like, why is there just this tiny sectioned off small portion of the cemetery with only a few graves and a barbed wire on the top of the fence? What is so special about these graves that it requires you to go underground to get to it? Also, Daniel isn't the most out of shape looking person, and Martha doesn't appear to be either. And based on her ability to warp from one place to another, which we'll cover soon, why can't she just warp herself to the other side of this fence the entire time and save both of us time? You're telling me Daniel can't just hop the fence here? I guess I shouldn't expect much from someone who can't even look where he's shooting. Anyways, this level does have a puzzle where you have to flip these levers in the correct order. I have no idea if there's a solution board somewhere, but I just played the guessing game and got it in around a minute or so, so no worries there. But yeah, let's just move on to the next chapter. The next chapter actually seems to have objectives to complete, and a logical final goal. While the space is very limited, it seems to be the second most interesting level since it manages to mostly give you tasks that make sense. Outside of having to refill the generator to open a front door that doesn't even appear to be electronic, most of the tasks are about gaining access to the next step, which happens to be a new room. But before you get into the building itself, you have to fight against a new boss type. This guy is a fat vomiter who spews his inner liquids at you, but half the time you can just initiate an ammo refill even if you don't need more, and just get locked into the animation of Daniel picking up the ammo thus seemingly making you invincible to his attack. It's not guaranteed, but seems like more than half of the time it worked. 
there's also two little monsters, which does make this fight ever so slightly more challenging, so that's a good thing. Unfortunately, though, this boss is still way too easy. As far as the rest of the outside time goes, please tell me why, during an earlier bit of dialogue, I could walk away from Martha and not even hear her. But her dialogue continues. Yet, when I'm in the generator room and I finish grabbing the jerry can, I'm unable to move beyond this invisible barrier until the cheesy dialogue is complete. Once inside the police station, we finally get some close quarters combat, which is actually a bit of fun. But in order to have that fun, you have to go through various rooms and find keys to access new rooms. Not exactly the most riveting gameplay, but you get rewarded with some fun gunplay against these monstrosities. Since this is the first level I really used my gun, I figured this is a good time to talk about... This. What is with Daniel's face when he's aiming the gun? Now, there's a puzzle in this level to open the safe in the captain's office, and you need to find a code. But, honestly, do you think I'm actually going to try to figure it out myself? Once you open the safe, you get this cutscene, and, well, I just don't have words for it. Now, there's a few more things you have to do in this level, but honestly, the only thing worth noting is figuring out a password for the computer, which you already know I didn't give a care enough to figure it out on my own. You then get a semi-normal cutscene, then you're teleported outside to fight another boss. This boss is way too damn easy, and I'm pretty sure I killed it faster than intended because, well, after killing it, I had to wait like 10 seconds. Then... And I'm pretty sure they drove straight into the gate that they refused to open from earlier. Congratulations, guys. At this point, you move to what I consider to be the most fun chapter in this game. Let me clarify, though. Just because I think it's the most fun, it doesn't mean it's good. It has its moments, but honestly, there are many moments that make zero sense. Martha's AI isn't good. And you can see some of these bad moments in the previous chapters, but it really is highlighted during this chapter. Warping from place to place other than actually walking or running. Oh, and even Daniel couldn't figure out where or who he was supposed to be. So, he decides to double himself during this cutscene. Now, as I said moments ago, this was the most fun chapter in this game. And that's because it actually provides that scary atmosphere albeit by taking direct inspiration from Silent Hill. That isn't a bad thing either. I mean, hell, Silent Hill is very popular, and if you can make something feel like it, it can be enjoyable so long as what you're making supports it. This level is mostly walking through the streets, though, with little to no room for exploration, but at least it feels like something intriguing, I suppose. They even include a few spots for combat, However, one thing that makes zero sense is how you're able to walk through all of this fog throughout the entire level, but suddenly, when combat starts, the fog becomes a barrier? How does that make sense at all? It's not logical, but I'm not going to harp on it much. Anyways, after fighting through... Well, actually, let me reword that. After shooting at the enemies who half of the time don't even want to attack you, you get to your destinations. One being a gas station, the other being a bar. I want to point out that it truly feels like the developers wanted this level to be as easy as possible. I mean, look at all this ammo. Like, it's everywhere. Anyways, the last thing I want to point out here is that the storm is actually kind of nice. It doesn't add much, but at least it's visually pleasing? The final chapter is a relatively quick one. This one takes place at a broken down house in the middle of nowhere. And guess who's in there? Hi, Dad. What the fuck? No clothes on, scratches everywhere, and just sitting in his chair by the fireplace. This chapter is just... You know, I'll just show you this and let you observe for yourself. You were always a failure. Even your little tricks keeping away have failed. I'll never let you take them. Now, it's a relatively small home, but it has enough rooms for it to feel larger than it is. Oh, and don't worry, there's still a ton of ammo everywhere. But this time, it's just the ammo boxes laying on the floor, just like in the police station. I should also mention, this game doesn't only take place in the house, as you get teleported into a new dimension. Yeah, we hadn't dimension hopped yet, but hey, 
why not start at the last minute, right? You go into this other dimension and through these forest areas, which, I'll be blatantly honest here, are poorly designed. Not only is it full of bugs, and yes, I know most games are, but the design itself just isn't interesting in the slightest. Oh, and it introduces you to the ability to climb up, but doesn't fucking tell you. Like, come on, this game released five days short of being three full years after Vice Age released, a game of which I just reviewed, and is a game that does the exact same thing of not telling you about something, which is pretty important. Granted, that game tells you about the important systems, which I'll give it credit for doing, but in this forest, I have to climb in order to progress. Then, I have to go prone under a rock to progress at one point. Both of these are things that are very important for the player to know that you can even do, yet it doesn't tell you that you can do them. Considering the only movement you're allowed to do as a player beyond walking or running and somersaulting, yeah, I'm not happy about that. But some of you might think, oh, that's nothing, it'll happen once and it's aggravated, but then you move on. Which, true, but the game designer in me just got wicked irritated with that, and I just have to call it out because that's not good design. Please, introduce your players to things like this, or you're bound to have shelf life moments. Anyways, I digress. The entire reason you're even in this new dimension is to get the final candle to finish this ritual to make contact with your mother's ghost. You get two candles easily in the house, then the game literally pulls you into the forest. Now, let's talk about the final boss fight against... Yeah. It's, uh, again, way too easy. Like, just another brainless AI that has no awareness of its surroundings. Which is funny, because this game uses Unreal Engine 5 and quite literally uses Marketplace assets. Which, by the way, isn't a bad thing in the slightest. But it can't use an AI that even has somewhat of intelligence. I mean, come on. There are plenty of AI-related things on the Marketplace to give these AI even a half-functional brain. As for the boss fight itself, I'm not even going to sugarcoat this shit. What an absolute shit show. After beating that, a passage opens from the wall and you enter this secret crypt-like area. Now, let's skip ahead to the boss fight, or should I say boss confrontation, which starts off horrifically. I mean, you're in this getting up animation, and when you're in this animation, the only control you have is the somersault, which you probably don't even think to use because you aren't currently standing. So because you're in this standing up animation, and then you're having to wait for the game to give you your controls back, then you have your controls back, but by this point you're probably already dead because while you're waiting for your damn controls back, the boss is already attacking you and you're dead. Luckily, the checkpoint is about 20 seconds before the fight, but still. Oh, and one of the ammo resupplies in this boss fight area isn't even accessible because of where it's placed. Luckily, if you hit your shots, you won't need all the ammo refills. Either way, after that, you have one final cutscene where the dad, who was already murked once, by the way, kills himself by hanging himself from a tree. Oh yeah, and you get a dialogue option here one more time. And roll credits. This game honestly feels like someone typed in a bunch of ideas into ChatGPT or something and asked it to produce a game for them, and this was the result. While the Aspen Hills level was kind of cool and the police station had its moments, this game was probably the worst video game I've ever played. Now, before I give my rating on this game, I do want to acknowledge how difficult it is not only to make a game, but release it. Many people don't realize how hard it is to release a game, and I myself have not released a game yet, though that'll be different at the end of this year, but the fact remains that this game was probably the most unpolished, incomplete game I've ever played that considers itself released. I've played demos and betas with more polish. Anyways, I really hope I never have to give a game such a low rating ever again after this, and if it wasn't for the police station and the Aspen Hills level, I'd go even lower. But I'm giving Stray Souls one and a half circuses out of ten. This is a game you have a friend play if you just want them to suffer, and you just want to watch them suffer, because you're an asshole. The best part of this game is just how funny some of the things are when they're trying to be serious. That's all for this review. If you have any suggestions for horror games you want me to review, 
please leave them in the comments below, or you can also tag me on Twitter with any suggestions here. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.